Hello and welcome to Great Lakes In-Depth. I'm Rick Mixter, today with an in-depth look at our freshwater resources. Today we'll investigate the 1905 storm which devastated Lake Superior. We'll see what some of its victims look like today. We'll also swim along some gigantic sandstone blocks which were supposed to build a bank in Chicago. The cargo is now a dive attraction in the Straits of Mackinac. We'll also hop into the river as the annual salmon migration heads upstream. We'll learn why it's important to intercept many of these fish before they finish their final run. All that in a profile of Duluth diver Elmer Engman on this edition of Great Lakes In Depth. Researchers are often asked, what is the worst storm on record? And that's a tough question. Is it measured by the lives that are lost, by the amount of ships that are damaged or destroyed, or is it by the strongest or longest winds? Either way you measure it, the 1905 storm is one of the worst on record. On November 27, 1905, those who didn't or couldn't avoid the storm warnings found their smoke quickly blown away from the stacks. The winds kicked up to 70 miles per hour, and the waves took the Ira Owen and her entire crew near Outer Island, Wisconsin. Loaded with barley, the ship and 19 sailors were never seen again. The Owen's loss was without witness, which wasn't true for some of the other ships that were damaged or destroyed in the storm. Most were fortunate, being pushed from deep water by 60 mile per hour winds that raged for 12 hours straight. The Crescent City was one ship that was tossed against the rocks. The 400 footers crew simply crossed to shore on a ladder and the ship was later lifted and refloated. Nearby, nearly the whole town of Duluth watched as another ship tried to make port. Well, that was, that was really an interesting spectacle. There was a tremendous snowstorm and uh, because of the, the kind of amphitheater construction of the uh, Duluth hillsides here, uh, virtually everybody in the community could see what was happening on the waterfront. And it was customary when there was you know, serious storm activity to kind of focus on the activity down at the canal. And uh, it was usually a fairly dramatic pageant with ships coming and going in the canal here with, with heavy waves. But in this storm in November of 1905 in particular, um, several ships were caught out and it was a real spectacle. Photographers documented the Matafa's struggle against the storm. Waves broke over the ship and snapped it in two within an hour, only 600 feet from shore. Thousands of people came down to the beach and you know, watched or tried to lend a hand or lit fires. People were going around gathering gloves and, and life-saving equipment, but the seas were so high that nobody could render any assistance at all. And, the, the uh, 24 men on board, nine drowned or froze to death before help could get to them the following morning. And uh, they were almost within shouting distance of the beach where you know, thousands of spectators were watching. So it was a, it was a terrible feeling and, and anybody who lived through the experience of, of witnessing it uh, remembered it for the rest of their lives. Sailors who made it to the bow of the ship were saved, but those in the stern didn't have a chance. Rescuers only found 15 alive when they managed to get to the Matafa that next morning. The ship wouldn't be salvaged until eight months later. The ship laid there all winter. It, it broke in half and sunk in shallow water out here, and people walked out over the ice to visit the wreck before it was pulled off in April or May of 1906. So it was you know, there, there are hundreds of pictures of it. Uh, we have dozens here. And, uh, that was only one of the wrecks, one of the 18 that were lost you know, on that same night. So the, the wrecks were strewn all the way up the shore and over in the Apostle Islands. And uh, it, was a, it was a terrible storm. The steamer Lafayette and its barge Manila were among those casualties. Pushed ashore north of two harbors, the Lafayette's crew lost one man as they abandoned both ships for shore. The Manila would be saved, but the broken Lafayette would only be salvaged in pieces. Today the wreck site bears no visible evidence of the 1905 storm. Beneath Lake Superior's icy waves lie pieces of the tragedy, where divers can only imagine what life aboard these vessels was like. Uh, well, there's a lot more brass out there than I thought there was. Of course, in the early days, brass was divers gold. And and that's what uh, Diver kind of looked at. And I was surprised to see some of that still down there. But of course, uh, Lake Superior storms uh, sometimes cover things up and uncover it too. So 
Every time after a storm, you might see something new on a wreck. Elmer Engman has been diving for over 30 years, and he's written a book about the wrecks along the Minnesota shoreline. I started that in the early 70s, too. Basically, I started a shipwreck guide. I started with maps because back then, you, there was not a lot of knowledge on where the wrecks were. And some of the divers that knew where they were probably wouldn't tell you. That was kind of a secretive thing. Some of that still happens today, of course. The diver finds something and they're going to keep it to themselves as long as they can. And that's why I started making the maps and the shipwreck guide to basically document all that stuff so someone else can actually do the same thing by just looking at, at the book and going through it. Elmer's books took a long time to prepare, as most of the information on the storms was hidden in old newspapers. I spent hours and or months at the library going through microfilm to the point where you both get uh, <laughs> nearsighted and uh, just writing all this stuff down and, and retyping it and, and putting it in uh, manuscripts for each specific shipwreck. Divers will find several of the wrecks here share the same year of destruction, 1905. And the most visited wreck was also taken during that storm. Madeira is a very nice wreck. The stern is intact, laying on its side, 80 feet of water. And that uh, can actually penetrate a little bit. And it's a beautiful wreck to see when it is clear. The Madeira was a steel barge pushed ashore like so many of the 1905 victims. Towed by the William Edenborn, both ships would smash into the shore with crippling damage. Today, the Madeira's bow points towards the surface and pieces of her middle are scrambled on the bottom. There is a lot there. In fact, uh, you have almost the whole ship there. A lot of it was uh, scrapped uh, in previous years, as much scrap iron as they could remove, but there's, again, a, a lot there. 78 sailors would never come home from the storm, and 19 ships were total losses. The question remains, could this happen again? Yeah, I think, you know, people are, are pushing to to maximize the profitability of the industry. And uh, you have to make judgments about what's safe and what isn't. And sooner or later, somebody makes the error of you know, misjudging the strength of the storm or the, or the strength of the ship. Um, but there are also equipment failures and that sort of thing, which result in vessels being where they don't belong. Um, the, the engines break down, the radar goes out. I think people are a lot smarter now and, and certainly much better prepared, um, but we still take risks, and the likelihood is that uh, you, you know it will it will probably happen again. Divers and especially snorkelers can visit two other 1905 storm victims along Minnesota's North Shore. The Amboy and the George Spencer were both lost along the beach, and they're now found mostly buried in the sand near two harbors. Finding transportation to some shipwrecks is tough, especially if you don't own a boat or you can't find a charter that'll take you out there. Shore access makes it possible for us to get out on our own, and that's perfect for the wreck of the C.H. Johnson. Very few cargoes remain on shipwrecks, as the grain would be swept away, ore and copper are often salvaged, and commodities are usually destroyed with the ship. It's doubtful that this cargo will ever disappear. These huge eight-foot blocks, marked with a chisel, remain after 104 years of the sinking. Cut from the Keweenaw Peninsula, they would never leave Michigan's Upper Peninsula as they were first intended. This sandstone was to become a bank in Chicago, but a September storm sent them to the bottom near St. Ignace. The crew of the schooner C.H. Johnson would be rescued after the anchor was lost and the ship ran aground near Gros Cap. But the wooden ship was quickly beaten down by Lake Michigan and little remains of the hull. Divers will find tiny pieces among over a dozen giant blocks, and the wreck is easily reached from shore. Look for a lot of bass in the area, and keep this wreck in mind for younger divers who want to experience their first shipwreck. Take your time and explore beyond the blocks to find pieces that have been scattered around the wreck site.
Finding the driveway off of Grocap Road can be tough and you may need a local's help to find it. Or you can check our detailed directions on our website, www.moreindepth.com. Now let's keep with our shallow wreck theme and dive Thunder Bay, the wreck of the Monohansett. The Monohansett managed to hide from a storm by anchoring on the opposite side of Thunder Bay Island, but somehow the engine room caught fire and threatened to take the whole ship. Loaded with 900 tons of coal, the wooden ship and its cargo were the perfect fuel for the blaze. The crew escaped to the island and the ship burned to the waterline. Today only pieces of the ship remain, but because this was a steamship, there are some big pieces. Here you can swim easily through the boiler, where the water was once turned to high pressure steam that turned the propeller. Easily explored in 20 feet of water, the ship is a great way to get introduced to wreck diving. The wreck itself was, was fun just because there was a skeleton of the wreck and you could see from front to back once you got to the boiler and, and checked the boiler out and the gauges that were on the boiler that we saw was fun. The prop, those are always interesting no matter how big or how small they are. Once you see the prop, it's, that kind of finishes off the shipwreck. Thunder Bay is one of the largest preserves on the lakes and it was one of the first. Many of the wrecks are deep and the Mono Hansett offers shipwreck diving to all skill levels. The trade-off is the fact that it's broken to pieces. The shallow wrecks, even though they're beat up, you get to spend more time and look more in depth. Even though they're busted up, there's more things to look at. And by spending more time, you can find out little interesting things that you wouldn't get to see on a deeper shipwreck. You'll find that very few charters visit the Monohansett, but it does make for a great shallow follow-up to many of the deeper dives of Thunder Bay. The fall is a good time to get a closer look at a big game fish that normally lives deeper within our lakes. During the fall, the Chinook run up our rivers, and when the water is shallow and clear, it's a great place for a creature close-up. Of all our fish species, only one can be called the king. The Chinook salmon is the largest of the various salmonid species that you will find in the Great Lakes. Uh, they were originally brought here from the west coast uh, in the middle 1960s, and they've done very well here, uh, both in Lake Huron and Lake Michigan. Uh, in good years, when forage is abundant, uh, adult salmon may reach 30 pounds. Uh, common size in the catch is probably more like 20 pounds. These monsters eat a variety of foods as they grow. Their first year in the lake, they eat a fair amount of insects. Uh, and as they grow larger, they switch over to feeding on uh, almost exclusively fish. And their primary forage in Lake Huron is the alewives and to a lesser extent the smelt. This last winter was a very mild winter and we had a fair crop of alewives born last year in 1998 which made it through the winter very well. And so we have a good forage base out there for the fish that we have in the lake at this time and we're hoping that that big 98 year class will give us some spawning in another year or so that will help carry this forage base through and continue the uh, good growth rates that we've seen this year. This fall run up the river is a final voyage for these salmon. Uh, they typically will live about four years in the lake at the maximum, although we have seen a few individuals that live five years and grew very large. And they are one of the Pacific salmons and therefore uh, they spawn once uh, at the end of their life cycle and die. Biologists take advantage of the run to capture the old fish and take their eggs, guaranteeing a next generation of king salmon. It's necessary to uh, continue the uh, salmon program primarily through stocking because unfortunately many of our rivers have been uh, closed off by dams and uh, the spawning habitat for these fish is just not there to sustain the fishery at the level we'd like to see. So during the spawning run, uh, the Department of Natural Resources operates weirs 
at uh, various rivers around Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. We take the eggs at the weirs uh, and uh, fertilize them there, ship them to the Platte River Hatchery and the Wolf Lake Hatchery where the fish are hatched and raised to an age of about six months. And then the, typically the egg take is in October and the following May uh, these fish will be planted back out into the Great Lakes as uh, Chinook smolts at a size of about three inches long. King salmon certainly earn their title by just their size, but anglers would argue that the name comes from their ability to nearly pull you overboard when you hook them. Yes, catching a king salmon is uh, one of the more special experiences you can have in Great Lakes fishing because uh, they are powerful fighters and uh, uh, a 20-pound fish can give you a tussle that will last several minutes uh, and run an awful lot of line off your reel. I recommend everybody should do that at least once. The king salmon, a welcome transplant to the Great Lakes and our creature close-up of the week. When we think about innovations to diving, we often think of the regulator and perhaps dive fins. But would we put air on that list? A new mix on the air that we breathe could certainly be considered revolutionary. Divers breathe from tanks filled with air, a mix of nitrogen and oxygen that is pre-mixed by Mother Nature to keep us alive. We get more nitrogen on the surface because pure oxygen is harmful if we breathe it all the time. Well, what scuba divers breathe is air, which is 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen. The oxygen is great, we obviously have to have it. The nitrogen has its place in using air, it keeps the O2 from being toxic with our normal breathing. But the big concern we have is that with nitrogen, that limits your bottom time. So with nitrox is another version of air where we've changed the mix. We've gone from a 21% oxygen, 79% nitrogen, to something other than that. For example, 32% oxygen which leaves us only 28% nitrogen and therefore longer times underwater or in fact a safer form of air to breathe. Nitrox increases the oxygen and decreases the nitrogen which can be harmful as we go deeper underwater. What nitrogen does is it can in fact limit your bottom time and or if you stay underwater too long you can get decompression sickness or bubbles of nitrogen form in the body that's commonly called the bends. Breathing nitrox is new for sport divers, but not for professionals. The government has been using enriched air for nearly 20 years. Nitrox has actually been around since the mid-1970s. NOAA research divers started using it in order to have a safer blend and, more importantly, longer bottom time on their underwater research. It started being embraced by the cave diving community who was looking for longer bottom times and safer dives and almost took on kind of a technical note. But in fact, nitrox is a blend that is great for 132 feet on up. So it's the perfect recreational diving depths. As a matter of fact, even the richest blends are great for the maximum normal depth of 100 feet for experienced divers. Nitrox limits the diver to a maximum depth. The diver can breathe the enriched air from the surface to that depth, but not deeper. That's why it requires special training. The reason why you need to have a little more training is you need to understand that as you richen up the blend of your air with oxygen, the maximum depth that you can dive with that particular cylinder of air or nitrox uh, will vary with the blend. The richer the blend, the shallower you take the tank. For example, a blend of 36% nitrox, which is commonly called NOAA Nitrox 2, has a maximum operating depth of 94 feet. Now that's a very conservative depth. Some divers will go deeper with it very safely. The training is so simple that Tom offers it in his beginning scuba classes. It allows divers, especially in the cold Great Lakes, to get more oxygen to the extremities that are normally restricted in colder temperatures. We actually offer nitrox training as part of our normal scuba program and it's really been received well. I mean, why wouldn't you want to dive with something that is safer than air? Another side benefit is when you do use nitrox, Divers, including myself, feel much more energetic after diving. One of the reasons is if you're outside in a cold day or if you're diving in cool 
water or swimming, you'll feel fatigued at the end of the day. And the reason for this is circulation. If you can, in fact, increase the oxygen going through the body because we have somewhat reduced circulation in our arms and legs, you give the body the energy that it needs or the fuel that it needs, and so therefore you're not working you know, on less than you could. So you do, in fact, feel better after diving. I'm just going to open bank one now that will bring the pressure up. And now I will bring bank two up and you can see the pressure rising. These tanks are designed to be full at 3,000 pounds. Air alone is triple filtered here at Sequatics, and Nitrox gets even more filtering. Tanks are specially marked so the diver can't mistake air from Nitrox. Computers are also recommended because air and Nitrox allow for different dive profiles. Here's an example of a nitrox and air dive computer. Because we breathe nitrox now, air is a form of nitrox, this computer can be used for both. By pushing the left button, we'll get the day and date. By pushing the left button again, we'll find out that this computer will always default to air. So it's an air dive computer. If I want to change the blend, however, say to nitrox, another blend of, let's see if we can't put 32 in here, all I do is push the right button until I see what I want. Let's say 80 feet, which is a pretty deep dive. At 80 feet, I'm allowed almost 50 minutes. It's 49 minutes of bottom time, whereas your normal limit at 80 feet for air is uh, 30 minutes. So we've ended up with 19 more minutes. You can split the difference, come up 10 minutes early if you want, and come up with a lot less nitrogen. Clearer thinking, better oxygen circulation, and longer bottom time are three reasons why Tom says this is a major revolution for Great Lakes diving. I think there's been a few things that have come along for diving that has revolutionized diving. Certainly the underwater pressure gauge so you don't run low on air goes way back. The buoyancy compensator, inflatable jacket so you can adjust your buoyancy underwater has gone a long way. Extra mouthpiece to share air should a diver run low so that emergencies are nothing more than annoyances. Uh, but nitrox, along with say dry suits which keep you warmer, have probably been two of the major advances in staying comfortable in the water as far as the comfort level goes. When I dive with a dry suit, I'm about twice as comfortable in cold water as I would be with a wetsuit, or at least I get twice the time. When I add nitrox and my dry suit, I stay more comfortable again. Divers should not confuse nitrox with the specialty mixes like helium that are used for extreme deep diving. Nitrox is perfect for sport diving limits that is above 130 feet. Now, let's take a look at our next show. Next week, we'll continue our profile of Chuck Feltner and explore a shipwreck through the eyes of the diver who discovered it. You won't want to miss this exclusive look at the Sandusky, a schooner that is one of a kind in the world. We'll also head north to the Apostle Islands and explore a barge that sank near Bayfield, Wisconsin. All that and a closer look at the Yellow Perch on our next edition of Great Lakes In Depth. Well, that about wraps up this in-depth look at our Great Lakes. I'm Rick Mixter. We'll see you next week.